Don Valentine, the founder of Sequoia, walks into a room. The person waiting for him in the room is about to become the world's greatest founder ever. A truly iconic founder figure. But right now, he's a nobody. And as Don Valentine recalls, That guy smells odd and looks like Ho Chi Minh. Don Valentine ends up investing in the person's startup and starts a massive chain of investment successes for his firm Sequoia Capital. Who is the person he meets on that day in that room? It's Steve Jobs. This is the story of Sequoia Capital, one of Silicon Valley's most notorious and enduring venture capital firms, investing in the likes of Apple, Cisco, WhatsApp, Airbnb, Zoom, LinkedIn, PayPal, and Google, among others, throughout its 50-year history. Its investments are now worth trillions of dollars in public market value, and graduates around the world would love to get a shot at working at Sequoia. Because having Sequoia Capital on your CV carries massive prestige. But how did Sequoia Capital build such a successful investing track record? Who are the powerful rainmakers making billions while working at Sequoia? And what can ambitious people learn from Sequoia's rise to the top? It's all about winning. And that's what we try to do here. Don Valentine is the son of a truck driver and comes from humble beginnings. His parents are uneducated and neither of them have even finished grad school. But in good Catholic fashion, they do value education and especially religious education. And so Don grows up in New York going to Catholic schools and ends up going to Fordham University. He graduates in the early 1950s and promptly gets drafted into the army. Don has a very negative attitude towards the military. I don't want to join the army. He doesn't like regimentation and he does things his own way. But one thing that he loves is electronics and technology. And he ends up getting put in charge in the army of trying to teach senior officers to use modern technology. So instead of fighting wars with horses and men, try using modern technology. He feels like a grandson trying to teach his grandmother to use an iPhone and thus doesn't get comfortable in his role. He transfers to the Navy and gets stationed in California. This is a major turning point in his life. When he comes out to California, he steps off the boat and makes it clear he's not going to leave. I have reached the promised land. It doesn't snow here in the winter. I'm never going back to the East Coast. Coast. I love this place. After a short stint at a company called Sylvania Electrics, Don takes a job at Raytheon in LA. A job that would greatly shape his skills as a legendary venture capital investor. Raytheon is one of the big five. That's not these boring auditing companies before one of them committed suicide, but one of the five major defense contractors. Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, General Dynamics and Raytheon. Don is working in the high technology industry selling computing solutions to these defense departments in the military. In parallel, as every nascent gorilla should, he starts taking part-time courses. At the business school at UCLA, he focuses on sales and marketing in order to further develop his sales skills. But after some time, he feels it's time for a change. He ends up getting recruited to move up to Northern California and join a fresh startup. A really hot semiconductor company, Fairchild Semiconductor. The company that built the first silicon integrated circuit. The incredible growth and demand for silicon is Fairchild's fault. Because Fairchild was the company who pioneered the idea that silicon was actually the most effective material to use for semiconductors. Here, Don knocks it out of the park like you would expect from a proper giga chat. He is selling Fairchild semiconductors to defense contractors down in LA and takes the company from a couple million dollars in sales to over 150 million in annual sales in just a couple of years. And 150 million back then is massive in today's dollar terms. We can just hope he had a proper revenue sharing agreement in place. He gets promoted and ends up running all of sales and marketing for Fairchild. And if you pay attention closely, you already notice how all of this 
this will be helpful to his VC career. Nowadays, semiconductors are used for all kinds of products. Back then, they were used for none. It was similar to today's crypto boom. Without the Reddit degeneracy, a new paradigm was being established and Don is at the forefront of it. There's one problem though. Every time Don acquires a big new customer, needs slight adaptations to the product they are selling or is entering a new market, he has to get the approval of the company's board. And there are much more potential buyers than they can service. Don wants to take advantage of the upside. He makes an ambitious plan and pitches it to the board. His pitch? Invest in some of their customers. Fairchild Semiconductor could help build up these young companies so that they become bigger customers in the future and taking advantage of an equity upside at the same time. But the board's reaction is disappointing. Absolutely not. That's a crazy idea. Who would want to do that? But Don wouldn't be Don if he would give up like that. He starts investing himself. Essentially, he becomes an angel investor. Whenever he works with a Fairchild customer that is a young company with growth potential, he chips in some money from his personal balance sheet. But as myself and many other angel investors know, there's a big problem. We only have so much capital. You want the money? Is we rich? Look. We're not rich. You're rich. We're broke. If only he could manage a bit of OPM, other people's money. This is where serendipity completely strikes. If Don hadn't made this move, it's seriously doubtful that there would be a Sequoia Capital and there may not even be a modern venture capital industry as we know it today. After a short stint at National Semiconductor, Don gets approached by Capital Group with an offer he cannot refuse. Most of you young ambitious gorillas might be aware of financial institutions institutions like Goldman, KKR or Apollo. Capital Group is a bit more under the radar, but guess what? Their AUM is 2.6 trillion US dollar. Having been founded in 1931, they are one of the world's oldest and largest investment management organizations. Their offer? They learn from Don all about this private angel investing he's doing. And so they make a suggestion. How about you do this full time, leave National Semiconductor and work at the capital group. We'll provide the capital, you provide the expertise. Deal. Peter? I'm with them now. It is 1972 and Dawn leaves his sales job to finally become a full-time VC at a time when venture capital is hardly an established industry. On the, at the outside, maybe $50 million nationally was the available pool of money to finance new companies and that's in the early 70s. He starts working with the capital group and the capital group sets up a new $5 million fund for their clients who want to ape into these high risk, high return startups in the semiconductor industry. Don starts making investments on behalf of capital group. In parallel, he starts working on creating his own company and raising his own venture fund. The company's name, Sequoia Capital. But fundraising proves to be harder than Don thought. Even though he has a good track record and working is experience at one of the biggest financial managers at that time, it's tough. The reception he gets from potential investors in his fund, so-called LPs, well, this doesn't sound like the investing business, you know? This isn't fixed income. To which Don replies, exactly. This isn't the investment business. This is a company building business. In a funny story, he goes to see Solomon Brothers, the investment bank in New York. He sits down with the bankers and gives them the pitch. The only thing they say, well, we see that you didn't go to Harvard Business School. To which he replies, right, I didn't go to Harvard Business School. I went to Fairchild Semiconductor Business School. <laughs> but the bankers don't deem that too funny. They are not going to invest with anybody who didn't go to Harvard Business School. A massive mistake for Solomon Brothers balance sheet. They will get slaughtered by the financial crisis, rightfully so. It ends up taking Dawn almost three years while working with the capital group to raise the first independent Sequoia fund. But finally in 1975, it happens. Sequoia launches with a small first fund estimated to be between three and five million US dollar. Also here, the fund focus is clear and the nature of work is not really comparable to anything that we know from today's venture funds. Back in the 70s, even before I joined and in the 80s, 
We were building the infrastructure of what is now called the internet. Once Don gets started, he sets what he calls a few ground rules for investing. Even to this day, many of these rules deeply influence how investments are being done at Sequoia and why it became the elite institution it is known as. The Sequoia Capital Investing Checklist. You must be in a very big market. The potential investment must be in Northern California. It must be in an advanced technology. It must have a high gross margin ability. It must have the potential for Sequoia to make a $100 million return on the investment. And lastly, the startup must be positively responsive to Sequoia's active participation. So Sequoia influencing business and helping them grow. And one of the most important aspects of the venture capital business, providing value to startups after acquisition, is an obvious superpower of Don Valentine. He is able to take his portfolio companies to the next level by helping them do sales and marketing and go to market or augment their finance and accounting. And his first deal is an immediate success. The startup was about to become a pioneer in arcade games, home video game consoles and home computers. The company's products such as Pong and the Atari 2600 would help define the electronic entertainment industry from the 1970s to the mid 1980s. And the investment tied perfectly back to Don's experience at Fairchild Semiconductors. Our first investment was a company called Atari. Don invests $600,000 in the company in 1975. And the very next year, the company ends up getting acquired by Warner Communications for $28 million. Buddy. Sequoia makes a quick 4x return. That's a great IRR, but does fall short of the 20x that Don is hoping to achieve in the long run. This is followed by his investment in Apple. And although Sequoia, represented by Valentine, invests in Steve Jobs super early when nobody else is willing to fund him. Without exaggeration, I would say that every meeting with Steve was a showstopper. The deal is simultaneously one of Sequoia's biggest L's. It is one of the reasons Sequoia just some months ago completely remodeled their entire business structure. What happened, of course, is a feeling that many Wall Street bets virgins know way too well. They sold too early. Sequoia prematurely ejects Apple from its portfolio. The position is closed in 1979, before Apple's IPO, for roughly $6 million. A healthy return, but shockingly low, considering that the firm today sits at more than 2.5 trillion US dollar market cap. Sequoia could have made billions, but as we will see later in the video, they learned their lessons. Probably one of Dawn's most successful investments happens in 1987. Dawn invests $2.5 million in a little company started on the GSB campus called Cisco for 30% of the company. 12 years after the constitution of Sequoia Capital, Don has learned his lessons. He's not letting this one go. So not only does he fully finance the company upfront with two and a half million and gets 30% of the company, the company then goes public shortly thereafter at a market cap of 224 million. And Don stays on the board. He doesn't distribute the shares. He remains chairman of the board until the mid 90s. Sequoia writes Cisco up and makes enormous, enormous returns on the company. And that will prove to be the playbook for Sequoia Capital going forward. Alongside all these investments that they are making, Sequoia keeps raising new funds. The funds steadily grow in size from that first fund of 3 to 5 million to around 150 million per fund in the 1990s, raising a new fund every three years or so. But Don realizes that you cannot possibly invest in all these companies and give them all the time and attention that they need to become successful. It is simply too much work. So during the 70s and the 80s, Valentine grows the business, hiring a small but hungry team of individuals around him. Well, I think it all started with Don Valentine, who had uh, two lessons that were pivotal in my mind. One was really an appreciation for markets and second, an ability to recruit non-conventional people. He recruited Mike Moritz, 
Right after he recruited Mike, he hired me. They go on to do a lot of deals and invest in the likes of Cisco, Oracle, Google and Yahoo early making significant gains. One of the success recipes during the hiring process, they look for people with functional experience in a startup. For example, design or application engineering, product, marketing and sales and so on. Don Valentine knows that sometimes the most amazing companies like Apple, Cisco look crazy and you need somebody that's willing to see the potential behind the craziness and stand up for them. And oftentimes that's not folks who are coming from Harvard Business School. One key to Sequoia's investment success is being early and building a diverse portfolio. That's why I work together with True PNL on this video. They are a bit like a public VC for crypto, a fundraising platform that has been around since last year. They also have a token called PNL, which I own. True PNL launched more than 50 sales with an average ETH of 10x or more. And there is a nice overview on their website about those. Two sales that are going on right now are, for example, Solidus and Consensus. Solidus has built an 8,000 square foot high performance computing data center in Europe. They are launching the world's first deflationary artificial intelligence token, which you can read up on their website. What I found impressive is that their existing hardware runs at 40% less power consumption than the industry average. Also, they have been approved for an EU grant of 3.5 million and have strong partnerships with Microsoft and relationships with corporations and organizations within the defense sector. The second project, Consensus, is the leading Ethereum software company. I have been a big fan fan of ETH since it hovered around 250 bucks and these guys enable developers, enterprises and people worldwide to build next gen applications, launch financial infrastructure and access the decentralized web. Consensus already serves millions of users, supports billions of blockchain based queries for their clients and has handled billions of dollars in digital assets. Notable investors include top tier investment funds including Amazon, JP Morgan and Coinbase. Lastly, if you own the PNL token I talked about earlier, it can reduce the token prices on the platform if you stake through their platform. You can buy them on Pancake, Gate.io or Uniswap. Fast forward to the mid 90s. Don Valentine is looking back at an amazing track record and establishing the foundation for what's going to become the world's most notorious venture capital institution. But now Don sees that it is time to pass the ball to the next generation. And the control of the company is passed to two men that were going to become tier one silverbacks in the venture capital ecosystem, Doug Leone and Michael Moritz. Michael Moritz had an impressive elite background, having studied at the University of Oxford and the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Similar to Jason Calacanis, the legendary angel investor we have also portrayed on this channel, Michael decided to first waste his potential in journalism. As I got a bit older, I became interested in journalism. And he might have stayed there forever, had it not been for one transformative conversation. I went to see um, a gentleman who was the editor of the Daily Telegraph. And he said, if I was your age, get out of Britain, go to America. And that was, the, that was what sent me to America. In the US, he started working for Times Magazine. A couple of years later into his career, he decided that he did not want to work in journalism for too long. I Bored with it now. And made the decision to leave time and pursue a career in venture capital. Back then, I saw what happened to people. It was eye-opening to me. I saw what happened to people who stayed in Germany and were 60 years old. And uh, cer certainly if they worked for time, which was a sort of cushy job, but you got sent all over the world and you wound up um, as an alcoholic. <laughs> which didn't appear to me to be a really beckoning career trajectory. <laughs> Having worked many years at Time Magazine, he left and co-founded Technologic Partners, a technology newsletter and conference company. And together with somebody else, I started a little company um, that um, published newsletters, staged conferences about the technology industry. Mm. And uh, so much for my... And, and that fella stuck with it and it, uh, eventually many years later, no thanks to me, um, Dow Jones bought that company. 
through that, he met a lot of people in the Silicon Valley and eventually was hired by Sequoia Capital in 1986. Similar to what we do in the Kevin John Discord, building 10-year master plans, this is the most important factor not only for people individually, but also companies as Mike Moritz describes it. Moritz would go on to be named as the number one venture capitalist on the Forbes Midas list in 2006 and 2007. Kind of the di comparison for venture capitalists. Today, his internet company investments include Google, Yahoo, Skyscanner, PayPal, Webvan, YouTube, Zappos. And he currently sits on the boards of companies like Klarna, Kayak.com, LinkedIn, Stripe and PopSugar. Moritz previously served on the boards of companies such as Google, PayPal, Yahoo and Zappos. Google was one of several co-investments with John Doerr of rival venture capital firm Kleiner Perkins and the initial public offering of the company in 2000 2004 made Moritz one of Wales' richest men. Compared to the well-spoken and noble Michael Moritz, Doug Leone is a totally different beast. Leone is born July 4th, 1957 in Genoa, Italy. His family moves to the United States when Leone is 11. When Doug Leone arrives in Mount Vernon, New York in 1968, the 11-year-old Italian immigrant doesn't have a clue. He flunks a math quiz in school because the terms true and false bewilder him. He wears unsightly slacks from Sears that invite classmates teasing. After school, he watches McHale's Navy alone on a black and white television, hoping to learn colloquial phrases that will help him fit in. <laughs> Lost, baby, we're being raided. <laughs> a few years later, Leone begins to get his bearings. He's working on boats as a teenager, sweating like a pig during his summer job. As he recalls, he can look across and see all the kids at the country club swimming pool. The young guys are talking to the girls, and he's saying to himself, I can't wait until I meet you in the business world. You just made your big mistake letting me in. Ambition, vulnerability, Indication. Lots of successful immigrants bottle up those feelings as they rise to prominence. They hide old slides and do their best to blend into America's aristocracy, not Leone. Even in his perch as a managing partner at venture firm Sequoia Capital, Leone still carries himself like a hard luck striver, scrambling for his first decent break. Because as he says, a lot of what keeps me going is fear. After getting bullied for many, many years, Doug finally finishes high school. This experience makes him tougher, but he's also a different person than he was when he arrived in the US. He now speaks English quite well. And he will put some prestigious stamps on his CV. Leone earns a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Cornell University in 1979, a master's in industrial engineering from Columbia University School of Engineering and Applied Science in 1986, and a master's degree in management from the MIT Sloan School of Management in 1988. After graduating from Cornell University, he starts working for Hewlett Packard as a sales guy and luck strikes again. His sales district is also where Columbia Business School is based. But that location had one important thing, at Columbia University, where someone explained to me what the ARPANET was. That caused me to get a job at Sun Microsystems. Again, that crappy sales territory, and you could say I made my own break because I asked some questions, but that unlucky break led to a lucky break. Sun Microsystem employ number 50 something, I can't remember. The ARPANET was established as Advanced Research Projects Agency of the United States Department of Defense. And it is often considered to be the early predecessor of the internet. When in the early 1970s, the first four nodes of the ARPANET became fully functional, things were a bit more complicated. Exchanging data between different computers, let alone different computer networks, was not as easy as it is today. But it is enough to get Leone more and more interested in the world 
of computers and internet. For a short time, he goes to work for a hot startup called Prime Computer, a producer of mini computers. Again, he chooses to work in a sales position, selling computers to Wall Street and making those sweet Benjamins. Maybe it is the intersection of technology and finance. Maybe it is him meeting one of the legendary silverback VCs at his job at Sun Microsystems, Vinod Kosla, co-founder of Sun Microsystems and founder of Kosla Ventures, a man who would deserve an entire based biography himself. Or maybe it is him taking a walk on 6th Avenue and wondering how the hell to generate massive amounts of wealth and afford all the luxury he is seeing around him. No matter what it is, Doug Leone forges a plan. He wants to work in venture capital. But even back then, chances of getting into VC are slim. It is a brand new industry and Doug has no Harvard on his CV. This is when he goes back to university and somehow manages to get into Columbia for a master's in industrial engineering. This then boosts his CV's prestige sufficiently to get accepted to an MBA at MIT. His approach to getting into VC is creative. He reaches out to all VC firms that are known to mankind at this point in time via written letters. And the VC gods give him the opportunity of his lifetime. Don Valentine of Sequoia accepts him for an interview. And so on 5 o'clock on a Monday, he gets interviewed by Don. And Don Valentine asks him exactly one question. What's important? <laughs> of course, I knew what's important. I spoke for about seven, eight minutes. I gave it, I, I mean, I gave it all. 30 seconds of silence, and he said, what else? Ah. <laughs> it's unclear how Doc was able to recover from that, but what is clear is that he got the job in the end. Don Valentine likes a couple of things about Leone, all of which are important to keep in mind for young ambitious gorillas trying to get into venture capital. His sales skills that he gained through the sales job he did, his hustler mentality as a young immigrant Chad that is willing to get his hands dirty, and his charisma that was undoubtedly also trained during his prior sales roles. And Doug is about to prove to Don that he made one of the best hiring choices imaginable. Normally as an angel investor, you invest in 20 companies and hopefully one of them does reasonably well and 10 or 20 access your money. Two or three will do okay and return a bit more than you invested and all the rest goes right down the drain. Doug Leone invests in three companies during his start at Sequoia and all three IPO'd. The truth is that Doug is so deep into network and software technology that he's able to distinguish future winners from from losers. If you want to learn something, look up his three wins, Renaissance Software, International Network Services and Arbor Hyperion. But prepare to spend a lot of time on understanding the business. To sum up Doug's early years at Sequoia, he joined Sequoia Capital in 1988 and becomes a managing partner in 1996. Enough said. He turned the partnership to a whole bunch of young investors. He just told us what he didn't want to do. In 1996, Doug Leone and Michael Moritz assume leadership of the firm. An incredible rise for an Italian immigrant that started from zero in a true testament of Don Valentine's leadership. Here's a little story that's in a book. Once I attended a presentation as an associate with Don. We left the presentation, Don left a note with green ink. He only wrote in green ink. He left that on a table for me to see. Doug, dash, not fit to listen to founders. Left that on a table for me to see. That was my feedback in the way I was questioning founders. Wow. You learn real fast. You know, you have safe spaces. I want feedback every Monday afternoon. Let me know if I'm doing okay. Let me tell you, that note from Don, was worth yeah. 20 of those meetings that we now have. And so right. I love the man. He gave me the shot of a lifetime. I respect him greatly. And uh, boy, he changed my life. He gave me a shot. But where there's light, there's darkness. 
and Doug Leone's early wins also built a false sense of confidence for him. He's about to experience his largest professional challenge yet. A challenge that will show the real values that Sequoia adheres by. And that challenge will come in 1999 during the dot-com bubble. The dot-com bubble refers to the period between 1995 and 2000 when investors pumped money into internet startups in the hopes that they would soon turn a profit. The speculative investments in these young startups, so-called dot-coms, drive up equity markets. The technology-centric Nasdaq index rises from less than 1000 in 1995 to a peak of 5408 on March 10, 2000. In the rush to cash in on the internet boom, many investors ignore traditional investment metrics such as the price to earnings ratio. Instead, they subscribe to a business model that favors building brand awareness and market share quickly, even if that requires offering services or products for discounted prices or for free. Low interest rates in 1998 helped drive up the amount of capital invested in dot coms, the exuberance starts escalating, with many founders and investors making fortunes overnight when dot coms went public. But as any Wall Street bets degen can attest, every bubble bursts at some point, and the bubble starts to burst in 1999. In 2000, companies such as Pets.com declare bankruptcy, and by 2001, the bubble has fully burst, taking many dot coms or dot bombs as investors start calling them with it. And Sequoia is not exempt from the action. In fact, their current dot-com crisis fund is doing so badly that the Sequoia partners learn the meaning of the word clawback. That is the industry lingo for the refund that venture capitalists are contractually obligated to make to investors if it turns out that the VCs pocketed more than their 20% share of the fund's overall profits. VCs can be required to pay clawbacks when they take their 20% share on a fund's early investment gains, which is a common practice, and later the overall fund loses money. This happens frequently after the technology bubble, which while it lasts, turns scores of young companies into skyrocketing stocks. The clawback provision means that many VC funds ultimately lose money, even though some of their initial investments were profitable. Leone has war room meetings in the Sequoia headquarters. It is so bad that some Sequoia partners owe more than their net worth to limited partners. How can they get themselves out of that? Most of the other venture capital firms choose to capitulate. Take the loss on the current fund, raise a new fund and start earning money through the fees again. But Sequoia doesn't want to take the easy path. Similar to the car manufacturer Ford that would refuse to accept government bailouts in 2008, Sequoia wants to make it on their own by sheer hustle. No one is going to lose money at Sequoia Capital. So they take funds that for example were 0.3x, meaning if it was a 100 million US dollar fund, it was currently worth only 30 million US dollar. In other words, investors in the fund have lost 70 million of US dollar through their investment. And Sequoia does the impossible by bringing them up to close to 2x, by giving up fees, not earning anything from the fund but reinvesting all the money into the startups and helping the startups on the ground to stay alive. The pride from having been able to pull off such a turnaround is going to form Sequoia's culture for years. And for years to come, Doug Leone will tell clients that these times are some of the proudest moments in the history of Sequoia Capital. It is not the moments when you are on top, having invested in Google or Cisco, but it is the moments when you are at the bottom in deep red territory that define who you really are as a firm. In 2012, Mike steps down as a CEO of Sequoia due to health reasons. Consequently, in this duo, there was just Doug left and he becomes the global managing partner at Sequoia.
fast forward to recent times. In 2017, Forbes names Leone a top 10 investor in the technology industry in the United States. He leads Sequoia's international expansion into China and India, which are considered to have been very important steps for the firm's global dominance. People should know that one, we have a group of partners in China, they make local decisions. And I also right. want people to know that for the last, I want to say 13 years, there's never been a dime extra that anybody in US made from China, meaning that we contribute to a pool, they contribute to a pool, and we all take the money out, so we get a bag of mixed nuts, but it's the same dollar value. Leone was responsible for investments, including ServiceNow, Aruba, Meraki, Rackspace, and MedExpress. He sits on the board of PlanGrid, NewBank, Action IQ, Numerify, and Lettuce Engines. In 2017, he is ranked number 693 on Forbes' list of the world's billionaires, with a net worth of 2.9 billion. In 2020, he is named on the Forbes billionaire list with a wealth of 3.5 billion. Pretty solid for a young, ambitious Italian immigrant. My life really went into into three different groups. In the first few years. It was about making it. Can I make it? Can I make it? Can I make it? From the age of 35 to 50, I just wanted to be the very best. That really, really drove me. From 50, 55 to this point, to 57, and hopefully through the end of my career, the thing that really, really drives me is working with younger people. It's a it's kind of a rude line, but I don't want to hang out with people like me. I don't want to hang out with old people. I want to hang out with people like you. Uh, and so at Sequoia Capital, finding a young, talented partner, investor, employee, and helping them in the greatest way possible is really what keeps me going now. What Sequoia Capital has turned into in the last decades is truly remarkable. Step inside Sequoia's Spartan offices at Silicon Valley's capital of capital, Sand Hill Road, and see what happens when a handful of hungry perfectionists like Leone and Moritz come together. Start at the entryway, packed with framed copies of financing documents for 98 companies. The hit parade begins with Apple's initial public offering in 1980. It includes includes the likes of Oracle, Cisco, Yahoo, Google, and LinkedIn, Sequoia's children. Since its founding in 1972, Sequoia has backed startups that now command a staggering 1.4 trillion US dollar of combined stock market value, equivalent to 22% of Nasdaq. Yet Sequoia doesn't display its heritage with well-heeled pride you might find at other top-tier venture firms, let alone the likes of JP Morgan or KK. We had all these posters, 200 IPOs, 20% of the NASDAQ, blah, blah, blah. Take them all off the walls. Take them all off the walls and let's act as if we haven't had one single win. At Sequoia, the historic IPO filings are crammed into drab, drugstore quality frames. Sequoia partners don't enjoy luxurious private offices. Instead, they toil at stand-up desks in a big open hall. Conference rooms are adorned with cheap plastic waste baskets. It's as if Sequoia's partners haven't fully realized that they might be rich. Or maybe they are trying to emulate the mindset of greats like Bill Gates, business silverbacks that have built world-dominating companies through an obsessed mindset. Bill Gates gave me a ride to the airport in his car and the, the radio was missing in the car. A big gaping hole in the dashboard. And I said, Bill, so what happened to you? Did you get ripped off? And he said, no, I had it taken out. Why do you have it taken out? Well, I drive from my home to the office, which is seven minutes and 32 seconds, and then I'll drive from the office to the airport, which is however long. And he said, if I've got the radio, I'm afraid that I'll switch it on and I won't be thinking about Microsoft. The past years, Sequoia's scrappy methods have produced the firm's biggest gains ever. A record nine Sequoia partners appear on the Forbes Midas list of the most successful venture capitalists, thanks to the firm's lucrative investments. At the number one spot was for a long time Sequoia partner Jim Gutz, who backed WhatsApp in 2011, well before Facebook agreed to buy the mobile messaging company for 19 billion US dollar. Leone ranks number six, followed by colleagues Michael Moore 
Moritz and Alfred Lin. Base pay at Sequoia isn't meant to be dazzling. While the salaries of the firm's nine general partners can top 1 million, Sequoia doesn't bother with Wall Street style guaranteed bonuses. And some of Sequoia's more junior partners have taken pay cuts to join. That's an easy sacrifice to make. The capital gains vastly exceed base pay. Their investing track record is simply too good. And with Sequoia boasting one of the finest investing track records in the world, you won't be surprised to find out that the partners hear over 200 pitches a month. And the chances of success are around 1%. Let me set it up at first. We're very cognizant that when somebody comes to Sequoia, they're prepared. We're very cognizant of the fact that in many cases, it's their big day, one of many large days. Maybe they're going to Andreessen, maybe they're going to Benchmark. So we, did, so we take that quite seriously. The meetings at Sequoia start exactly on time, they end on time, and no one has their, their iPhone on. It goes against all our culture. No one's doing emails just to be straight. And depending on which partner you are meeting, the chances might be higher or lower. Everybody has their specialization. Regardless of whether a meeting ends with a yes or no, founders describe their hour with Sequoia as one of life's most intense experiences. Moritz is the detective, listening to each detail of a founder's story and asking few eerily perceptive questions. Both Lynn and Schreier are the growth hackers, looking for ways consumers oriented startups can rocket ahead even faster. Goetz and Guggenheim mechanics, drawing on 25 years a piece of experience with enterprise technology companies to gog a startup's chances of prevailing. Then there's Leone, he likes to challenge founders right away to find out who is tough enough to succeed. Tony Singale, a seasoned Silicon Valley executive, recalls a 1990s meeting in which Leone grabbed his resume, flipped it across the desk and snarled. What do you know about running a startup? They bickered for 10 minutes before Leone declared, Okay, now we know you're a smart motherfucker. Now we can have the meeting. And if you do finally succeed, you are likely to have a verbal agreement in place just a few hours after your opening pitch. This has even earned them the respect from people like Elon Musk. I went to see Mike and he decided to invest basically in a, I think in the course of maybe 30 minutes or something. And that was it. And then Mike wired $5 million uh, to our accounts without really actually having signed anything, just following like a real short meeting. That was it. For Sequoia, it's about not complicating things. And they are also getting respect because they seem to be genuinely helpful. One of the mantras of VC is to be helpful operationally, but few are really. But despite Despite its success in picking companies, Sequoia are not immune to failure. The three biggest mess ups? Twitter. Given the chance of a 10% stake in the firm in 2007 when it was valued at just 20 million, but Sequoia suggested they wanted a 20 to 30% stake and lost out. <laughs> Similarly, Sequoia made a mess of their investment in Sean Parker's business. And so when Mark Zuckerberg teamed up with Sean Parker, Zuckerberg decided to play a prank on Sequoia. When he was invited to a funding meeting in 2004, Zuckerberg showed up late to the meeting, wearing pajama bottoms to pitch his side hustle called Wire Hog. Not only that, but he then began his presentation entitled The Top 10 Reasons You Should Not Invest. But Sequoia had the last laugh with Facebook agreeing to buy WhatsApp with Sequoia, earning over 6 billion thanks to their 40% ownership in the firm. Lastly, as we said earlier, Sequoia also made the mistake of selling their Apple stock in 1979, just 18 months after they bought it. But these failures have helped the firm to adapt and reshape their methodology, not being so stubborn over percentages, holding onto their winners for longer, and sometimes overpaying for companies that are set to change the world. All of these experiences are also the reasons why Sequoia recently switched to a totally new fund structure, an evergreen fund, something that so far has not been seen in the industry. What can we do with this asset in a win-win? What I mean by win-win, well, win-win-win. Founders first, limited partners, in our case, 70% are nonprofits and Sequoia. And we thought, boy, if we could telegraph to founders that we can be with you for a very long time, that's a win for the founders. 
if we can tell limited partners, we'll help you manage your distribution so you don't sell the day you get them, hold them for the long term. And from our standpoint, if we could be on these boards, a handful of boards for a long time, that really helps us as well. So we thought we had a unique asset that not everybody can replicate because, you know, if we say we generated seven trillion in market cap, 250 IPOs, it doesn't take much to, to fund for another partner to say we, we kind of did that too. We have 100 IPOs. But for the Sequoia Fund, what you need is a corpus of big exits. And it is moves like these, building an entirely new fund structure, holding on to winners for longer and delivering exceptional quality that have kept Sequoia in the top spot for years. Don Valentine, who passed away in October 2019, was called one of a generation of leaders who forged Silicon Valley and chose the name Sequoia because it conveyed the longevity and strength of the tall Sequoia trees. Partners have noted how humble Valentine was, being someone who refrained from putting his own name on the business. But the legacy at Sequoia lives on, with further fundraising going on, in order to invest in some of the greatest ideas this planet has ever seen, some of which may not even exist yet.